like to invite you to bow your heads for just a moment for an added word of prayer as we open his word. Dear Father in heaven, what a treat, what a privilege it is to be here in your house. And as we open the word together, we pray that Holy Spirit will come and inspire each of us with understanding and with memory. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, Jesus was tried and crucified and died. It came at the time of the Jewish celebration of the Passover, 31 AD. This is the Passover season. There's a rich history here of their deliverance from Egypt, which is a symbol of deliverance from the sin problem, right? They were delivered out of Egypt and the blood over them, the blood over the doorpost. So uh, many Christians are thinking about the resurrection. What an idea that is. What an important idea that is. There's an empty tomb over there someplace. And uh, it's because Jesus came out of the tomb in order to provide all of us with eternal life. Someone asked recently this question, what is more important, Christ's death on the cross or the resurrection? I never heard it quite put that way before. So I began to ruminate on it. I come from cow country. Cows ruminate, right? <laughs> I began to ruminate on that. I think Jim brought that idea to me. Somebody told, mentioned it to him. It occurred to me that the grace and love of God undergirds all of this. He loves us all very, very much. If there were no love, if God isn't love, and the Bible says that God is love, right? If there were no love, you know, God has an infinite capacity to love, just like he had an infinite capacity to suffer for all our sins. Infinite capacity to love. But no love on God's part, then there would be no plan of salvation. It's founded and grounded in unselfish love. I'd like to read, if you invite you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, which illustrates very nicely this love that God has for all. Philippians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Galatians, Philippians chapter 2. I'd like to read verses 6 through 8. We read this often here. It just uh, reminds us of Jesus again, what he did for us. Verse 6 says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but put himself of no, made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's the love of God. And if there were not such unselfish sacrifice, there would be no plan of salvation. And if there were not the plan of salvation, there would be no incarnation, which means Jesus born into our family. No incarnation. If there were no incarnation, there would be no righteous life to justify me. You know, the Bible says that he did no sin. He was a lamb without spot or without blemish, right? In his perfect character, lived out in this world, in my organism, for my justification. And if there were no righteous life, the crucifixion would make no sense. For Jesus is the Lamb of God. And if no crucifixion, there would be no resurrection. If there were no resurrection, there would be no ascension. And if there were no ascension, I would have no representative in heaven who ever lives to make intercession for me. Isn't that neat? What an idea. We call this the Christ event. All these things to combine. If there were no high, high priestly ministry of Jesus, 
All that goes before would be meaningless for Jesus. The Bible says that in Hebrews 9, verse 12, that he ministers with his own blood. As our high priest, he ever lives to make intercession for us. We could go on and on with this. All these things we've mentioned, for our purpose of our discussion today, all these things are called the Christ event, the incarnation, the birth, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension to heaven on our behalf. All of this, the Christ event. All these are essential for God's plan for us. What is that plan for us? All that he did was for us. You find that thought in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24. Everything that he's done has been for us. I think everything has been on on hold for 6,000 years now in order that we might have the benefits of salvation from a loving God. So what is this plan for us? I just love that passage that uh, Roger read from Ephesians chapter 3. I want to read parts of that. If you'll turn with me to Ephesians, the third chapter, back a few pages to the left. Ephesians chapter 3. I want to read verse 11 and then 14 to 19 again, just for our edification. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11. It says, according to the eternal purpose which he, pur- which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's an eternal purpose, an eternal purpose for everything. There's an eternal purpose for us as we're gathered this morning. Now verses 14 to 19. It says, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the length, I'm sorry, what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes the knowledge that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's what God wants for us. That's his eternal purpose. He wants us to live forever. You know, people on their deathbed, they struggle. We weren't meant to die, okay? But we do, don't we? But God has a higher purpose than that for us. That we might have life everlasting. Eternal purpose here. Formulated before we were born. Yes, before the creation of the world. Ephesians chapter 1. Before the foundation of the world, Ephesians chapter 1, before the foundation, he had this in mind for us. Verse 3, I'm going to read verses 3 through 7. Ephesians 1, 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. How many blessings? All. All spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ. according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption, through his blood and the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. What an idea. The sin problem did not take God by surprise. Deep plans were made beforehand, even before the foundation of the world. And he saw us. He saw us here in Sierra Vista, way ahead in time, uh, being thankful and joyous for what he's done. He saw us. So what is the most important thing he has done? 
I can't tell you if it's the crucifixion or the resurrection, but this I know. It's like the human eye, such an intricate organ. In order to work so we can see, all kinds of little, even microscopic cells have to work together simultaneously in order for us to see and focus and be enlightened. I'm liking this to the human eye now. All these little structures in the eye must cooperate with the brain and with the heart and with the blood vessels. Everything works together. So the Christ event, I'm liking it to the symbol of the human eye. All these things were meant to be and they were brought into existence at the same time. Like the Christ event. All he has accomplished for us and the work in unison so that this salvation plan can go into effect. The greatest part of it all is the love of God that brought all this and made this all possible from which flows everything else. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We call the result of such love the gospel of Jesus. That's the result of all this love. In AD 31, Passover came on a Friday. In Luke, the 23rd chapter, it says it was on the preparation, the preparation day for the Sabbath that Jesus was crucified. He dies and he rests in the tomb on the Sabbath. Not unlike the creation of the world. He created the world in seven days and then what happens? He rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Work was done. And then Sabbath. God rested and, and invites all of us to enter into his rest even today. So who is Jesus? That's what I want to talk about today. Who is this Jesus? An age-old question here. In the ancient world and in the Eastern world, the question is asked, who is Jesus? Ask a Hindu. And he says, Jesus is a good man. He was a prophet. Ask the Buddhist. He says, it's a good man who worked miracles. Ask Muslims. Yes, Jesus was a good man, even a descendant of Abraham, but Allah is God. <laughs> okay. Why are humans so hesitant to say who Jesus is? If he's God, why do all we're so hesitant? Because nobody wants to answer to somebody else. That's what the proud human heart is like, right? So, uh, even among professed Christians, there's some confusion. Who is Jesus? Not a real clear answer out there, not a clear united answer about who he is. As early as the end of the first century, a new generation had arisen, a generation who had never seen Jesus in the 90s AD and, and on into that second century. There was a lot of confusion developed. These people were not contemporary with Jesus when he lived here on the earth. Church leaders in Alexandria like Arius rose and he questioned the eternal deity of Jesus. Men like Athanasius rose up in the fourth century and countered that Jesus was really God. And so this confusion went back and forth. Athanasius, Athanasius was banished five different times because he believed that Jesus is God. He was the champion of the eternal deity of Jesus as opposed to Arius. <clears throat> so who is Jesus? It affects how we understand the triune God. If Jesus is really God, as the Bible states so clearly that he is, then he's a part of the Godhead. So the idea of a triune God rises on falls, fall, rises or falls on who we believe Jesus is. <clears throat> so 
there were no, more, no less than 45 church councils in the fourth century discussing this matter. That's how much confusion there was. But what about the eyewitnesses who lived around and knew Jesus personally? Let's take a look at their, at their confession. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. <clears throat> That's an easy one to find. I like to hear the leaves of the Bible turning. Music to my ears. John chapter 6. Let's look at verses 67 to 69. John 6, 67 to 69. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Many left him when he, when he told them some pretty pointed ideas about him being the, the bread. Okay. Verse 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the what? The Christ. That refers to the divinity of Christ. Thou art the Christ and the Son of the living God. What an idea. Let's look at another one. Mark 8, 22 to 29. To the, left, to the left a few pages. Mark chapter 8, 27 to 29. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the town of Caesarea Philippi. And by the, and by the way, he asked the disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, some say Elias. People even in Christ they weren't clear as to who Jesus was. It's the age old question. Others, one of the prophets. Verse 29, and he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and said unto him, thou art the Christ. What a confession. Let's look at another one. John 1, verse 49. Back to John again, to the right. John 1, verse 49. Nathaniel, <laughs> he's just being called here to be a, a, a disciple. Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. How do you like that one? A man who just met him just a little bit before. I've often thought about uh, Gabriel's conversation with Mary just before Jesus was born. Let's look at it. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Gabriel to Mary here. Luke 1, verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also... That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the what? Son of God. What is the tense in this, in this passage? Future, right? When he's born, he shall be called the Son of God. Those kind of things in the Bible are very, very important to understand, as we'll see here. From this point onward, Jesus is called the Son of God. The only begotten Son, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his what? Only begotten Son. Some of my thoughts today I've, I've gleaned from a recent book that was published by Pacific Press by Ty Gibson, The Sonship of Christ. So I'm going to give him credit for some of the things that I'm going to say here in just a few minutes. But uh, what does the Bible mean, Son of God? Some have insisted that bearing a title like that must mean that at some point that Jesus must have, may have had a beginning. Son of God? That he could not have eternally existed, that he could not have eternally existed beside the Father, whose son he is. In other words, that he must have some kind of a beginning. Our normal understanding of son of uh, son includes the, the Son of God, or uh, as it said here, includes the idea of birth. Begotten means to be what? Born or birthed. The nation of Israel was birthed, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, 4 to 6. So there was 
There was a time when, when Israel was not, so people look at that. Being birth suggests a point of origin or beginning. That he must have somehow a long time ago been generated from God at some point in the past, a long time ago. A starting point, if you were. This is what people have believed. They built doctrines on this idea of trying to understand the expression Son of God. Some even go so far as to say that Jesus is a created being. Two Christian church bodies believed that, that he was a created being. In reality, some truths can only be understood by way of a paradox. An example of that could be law and grace. Many have not been able to bridge the gap between law and grace in a meaningful way. So they just say, well, the law was done away with. That's how you get rid of that paradox, right? Seems paradoxical. We must not let two ideas fight with each other that seem to be opposites. The correct conclusion must include both without contradiction. For the Bible teaches both. In our our understanding of things, we must not make the Bible disagree with itself. Sometimes people take a very unclear text that it seems paradoxical to a whole bunch of texts in the Bible and build a doctrine on that unclear text. What's wrong with that idea? If you do that, then you're making the Bible disagree with itself. Does the Bible disagree with itself? No, No, we must not make it do that. That is a problem that humans have. So here's the paradox that we're talking about today. Here's the paradox. The Bible calls Jesus God's only begotten son. The Bible describes him as occupying a subordinate position to the father. Doesn't it do that? The Bible does that. Under the father, depending upon the father. That's all through the gospels. Jesus prays to his father. He depends on the father. He has faith and trust in his father. That's one side of the paradox. Do you understand what I'm saying? The other side of the paradox is like this. The Bible says that Jesus is the very nature of God. In Colossians 2, 9, it says, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You see how that's paradoxical to the other thing I mentioned? He's called God in John 1, 1 to 3. He's defined in Colossians 1 as the creator and sustainer of everything, heaven and earth. In Isaiah, he's called the everlasting father in Isaiah 6, verse 9. In John 8, 58, he's called the great I am. In Micah 5, that little verse, Micah 5, verse 2, it talks about out of Bethlehem would come forth one whose goings forth have been from what? Everlasting, everlasting. In Revelation, he's called the first and the last, the beginning and the end. All this about Jesus. Paradoxical? The tension between these two ideas is obvious. And sometimes we have a tendency to ride one side of the paradox. That's a dangerous thing to do in any study of the Bible. From the biblical perspective, He's both God's son, and yet he is the almighty God. We don't want to diminish from either of those, right? The solution must be consistent with both claims. Both sides of the apparent paradox need to be harmonized. This has caused no end of trouble. Not following a a simple biblical principle has caused no end of trouble in people trying to understand who Jesus is. We may have trouble because of a selective, narrow reading of Scripture that overlooks the overall storyline of the Bible. Why do we tend to do this? 
You know, one of the dangerous things that we, we, we maybe tend to do, and maybe in my past experience I can think of doing this, is that we read the Bible like a doctrinal textbook. <laughs> do you know what I mean by that? Uh, much like an encyclopedia. Uh, from which we develop theological proof texts and creeds, right? Instead of looking at the overall storyline in the Bible from the creation of the world and finally the new earth. We take the word son as, represented, as, rep, as, re, as reference to Jesus and proceed to reason from human experience. We tend to reason now from human experience when we hear the word son, that at some point he must have emerged from God, okay? albeit a long, long time ago, right? That doesn't make any difference to the argument. And so we reason, people reason, that Jesus cannot be God in the same sense that the Father is, because it came from the Father. That's how people reason. Human reasoning here, we can't do that in our understanding of Scripture. And then, we say, then people will say, well, yeah, he, otherwise he couldn't be God's son. Can you, see what, what, can you see what I see here? In order to deal with this, we make things up to fill in the gaps. Can't do that with the scripture. Take both sides of the paradox. He is God's son. Believe it, right? Peter said that. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. But on the other hand, he is very God, with life original, unborrowed, underived. Paradox? Indeed a paradox. Lots of false doctrines out there because of such fuzzy thinking as that. We've got to be careful. We have to be careful as we study the, study the word, that we not make it disagree with itself and ride one side of the paradox and come up with a very false doctrine. The world is full of such, such doctrines. And, right now. So what says the scripture? Let's go to the Bible. That's the place, right? All this because of, <clears throat> all this bears on the efficacy of Christ's birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. Everything is dependent upon that as we read before. So let's start with Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. This is uh, Paul's introduction to his book of Romans. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. This is a passage I just love. Here's what it says. And as we read these verses, I'm not going to make very much comment on them. I just want you to, to hear it with freshness. The freshness and the purity of the pure word. Okay, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised aforetime by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, which was made according to the seed of David, according to the flesh. He was made to be the son, right? Then verse 4 says, and declared to be the son. He was declared to be the son. Made to be the son and declared to be the son. It's much like in, in uh, Gabriel's uh, conversation with Mary. That holy thing shall be, shall be called the son of God, right? Future tense. Verse 4. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. That's part of the Christ event, right? Declared to be the Son of God. Let's look at another one. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Off to the right here. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Let's take all the comfort we can out of these scriptures. They were given to us for a reason, right? To take some time every day and spend with the scriptures, learning to know Jesus. Actually, why do we study the scriptures anyway? It's to learn to know Jesus. It's not to try to quench a, an argument, a theological argument. It's to learn to know Jesus, right? 
because the whole book is about him. Hebrews 1, verses 5 and 6. For under which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. There was a day when he was begotten, right? He never said that to any of the angels. And again, I will, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Okay. Take all, all you can out of that little passage. Verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. When he came into this world, he says, let all the angels worship him. But who is he really? He's God. Otherwise, he wouldn't ask the angels to worship him, right? Let's look at another one. Hebrews 5, verse 5. <clears throat> so also, Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, that has to do with the ascension, doesn't it? When he went back to heaven, he ascended to heaven, what did he become? Our high priest. Okay. Let's start again with verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to made an high priest, but he said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. <laughs> God's son, by virtue of the, incarn of, the in of the incarnation in chapter 1, and by virtue of his... Ascension in heavenly priesthood by virtue of that, right? See, none of this disagrees with the idea that he's eternal God, does it? We can't make the Bible disagree with itself. Let's read another passage. Acts 13. Acts chapter 13. You'll find things like this scattered all through the New Testament. We're just giving some examples here. Acts chapter 13. Paul and his companion are in Antioch of Pisidia, what's now uh, modern Turkey, in a strange town. He goes into a synagogue on Sabbath day, and they recognize him as being a Jew, probably from Jerusalem. Maybe they were introduced that way. Somebody knew him, perhaps. And they want to know what's going on in Jerusalem, because a lot of stuff was happening in Jerusalem in these days. It's not too, not too long before the the destruction of Jerusalem, and there was a lot of trouble between the Romans and the Jews at that point. So they called Paul to preach. Tell us what's going on. And in verse 32, <laughs> characteristic of Paul, he says, and we declare unto you glad tidings. What's he telling you about? He's telling him about Jesus, right? We're telling you glad tidings. Glad tidings are the gospel. And we declare unto you glad tidings how that the prophet, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus again, as it is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Okay, what do you get from that text? Christ event again. Resurrection is a part of the Christ event, just like the ascension was and the incarnation was. Only he's saying here, by virtue of the resurrection, by virtue of the resurrection, this day have I begotten thee. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Wow. All, the all important thing is, who is Jesus? My friends, he is very God. He is God. John 1.1 1, 1 says, he is God. It's, is it true? Okay. It's he that dwelleth in the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Christ, being the Son of the Father, is all about the origins of the plan of salvation. Not the origins of the Godhead, but the origins of the plan of salvation. He becomes God's Son by virtue of an agreement in that council of peace long before the earth was created because God in his foreknowledge knew that there would be sin come upon the earth, right? And he made a provision for it. I believe, that, I believe the Bible is clear that Jesus had life original, unborrowed, underived. Christ being 
God's Son is not about this not about the origins of the Godhead, but about the origins of the plan of salvation that was laid firmly and fully before we even came along. In eternity, the Ancient of Days, that's what the, father, the one we know of as Father is called in the Old Testament. In eternity, the Ancient of Days, as the Old Testament calls the Father, and the Eternal Word, who is Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit developed a plan. We call it the covenant, the covenant of peace that was between them, as it says in Zechariah chapter 6. A plan in which the eternal word would come to our planet and, and develop a rescue mission for the likes of us. What love is preferred here? He was birthed from the womb of Mary, born into our family. In Isaiah 9, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is given. Okay? He was born, he came into an existence that he never ever knew before. And he's a being. We might call him, refer to him as the God man. Not another being in the whole universe like that, who is God and man. Only one. And he was birthed into our family for, to meet the terrible emergency that sin had brought. In Isaiah 9, 6, he's called the everlasting father. He is the new father of the human family, 60 centuries of us. And in the plan, one would be the father God and one the son, and the son who is one of us would depend totally upon the father just as like we do as he put all of his faith and trust in the Father, so we can have that same privilege of putting our faith and trust in Jesus just like Jesus did. In fact, it's called the faith of Jesus. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit would make it all meaningful to us. That's the Holy Spirit's work in this, in this, in this plan. Let's look at it. John, the 16th chapter. John, the 16th chapter. Don't you love this? John 16, starting with verse 13. John 16, verse 13. How be it? Jesus talking here, if you have read a letter edition, most of this is words of Jesus. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me. Who's talking here and to who? <laughs> Jesus is talking to the disciples, right? And he's talking about who? The Holy Spirit, right? He shall glorify me, Jesus said. He shall receive of mine and do what? Show it unto you. He's the great shower of Jesus. And when we study the Bible for the purpose of learning to know Jesus, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit is there to teach us and to show us Jesus. Verse 15, all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, he that he shall take of mine, Jesus is talking, he shall take of mine and shall do what? Show it to you. <laughs> okay. When we read the Bible, it's for the purpose of learning to do what? Know Jesus, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, the covenant really is between the Godhead. Three of them, right? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Three of them. The covenant is between the Godhead. I want to read something to you that's very special. It's found in the 89th Psalm. The 89th Psalm is the covenant chapter. This is a song that the Old Testament church sang. Psalm, the 89th chapter. And notice what it says here in this covenant chapter. Psalms 89. I'm going to start with verse 26. Psalm 89, verse 26. Picture with me, who's talking to who? <laughs> Years ago, when I was going to Gem State Academy, I had a teacher. 
that said we need to figure out who's talking to whom and under what circumstances. This is the formulation of the covenant. And here's what it says. Verse 26. He shall cry unto me, thou art my father, my God. Who's talking here? Jesus. Thou art my father, my God. And what is the tense here? Future tense, right? <laughs> Psalms is written way back in a thousand years before Christ. He shall cry unto me, thou art my God, my father. Thou art my father, my God and the rock of my salvation, and I will make him my what? Firstborn. firstborn. <laughs> Who's talking here? The Father. I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep with, for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. Covenant is between the Godhead, and God is one, right? One God. Three persons in the Godhead. We really can't understand, begin to understand the triune God until we understand this, that Jesus is God. Unequivocally, <laughs> kind of hard word to say. He is the seed of the woman. He was born here, one of us. Let me ask you a question. Why would they take on the role of father and son? A father-son relate. Why would they take that role in the plan of salvation? Because they love us. That's why. There's no other way we could understand that close relationship that exists between us and them and between the triune God itself, himself. He loves us, wants us to understand the tenderest of human ties, fatherhood and sonship. It's all through the Old Testament, passed down from the, through the generations, father to son. It's mentioned that way in Luke chapter 3, where it talks about the genealogy of Christ. And as Jesus' faith went out in total trust to his father, so that we can understand trust and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the life of Jesus. Look how he spent his time, sometimes whole night in prayer and agony with his father. Uh, for us. A good Sabbath afternoon read would be John, the 17th chapter. Do you know what that chapter's about? Jesus is in the very shadow of the cross already. And you know what's happening? He's praying for us. Jesus is praying for us. You take all the comfort you can out of that. Don't you like it when somebody tells you that so-and-so is praying for you? Jesus has prayed for us here. Psalms 10, verse 5. I'm, I'm sorry, not Psalm. Hebrews 10, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. And we're getting close to being done here. I hope nobody's getting nervous. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Here's what it says. Wherefore, when he cometh in the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not but a body thou hast prepared for me. Who prepared the body? <laughs> he was born of the Holy Spirit, and the Father must have had something to do with this as well. This was a plan of the triune God for our salvation. This father-son relationship that we, that we maybe don't understand as well as the Bible describes it for us. A human body was given to him with the effects of 4,000 years of degeneration in the physical, mental, and moral faculties. You can read about that in the Tsar of Ages. 4,000 years of degeneration in the physical, mental, and moral faculties. These are characteristics of the brain, right? The brain is a physical organ that houses the mind. And those faculties were degenerated. That doesn't mean they were sinful. That means that, that he came about with those faculties, with those powers of mind and body like we have. 
sin accepted. These faculties were not sinful, but had the effects of 4,000 years of degeneration from Adam on down to his time. With that, Jesus went forth and developed a perfect character that we call the faith of Jesus. That's my righteousness. Christ is my righteousness. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 7 to 9. Steve and I have talked about this passage quite a bit. I love this passage. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 7 to 9. And again, he limiteth, limiteth a certain day, saying... And David, today after so long a time, wait a minute, I got the wrong one. I think it's not that, it is chapter 5. Did I say 4? Yeah, it's chapter 5, let's start with verse 7. Talking about Jesus here. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, Who's that? The Father, right? Jesus is praying to the Father. Okay. And was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. Wow. Author of eternal salvation for all who obey him. He was the perfect son. He is the perfect Savior. He is the Son of Man, God's Son. He is the eternal Word. He is worthy of our deepest worship, our Lord and our God. So this Father-Son arrangement goes back into eternity. God foreknew that sin would come onto this planet Earth. His eternal plan is an eternal purpose for us all. He didn't let sin deter his perfect plan. He didn't throw us away. He knew what was going to happen. It did not take him by surprise. But he he arranged for it. And when we sinned, he didn't just throw us out like refuse. But notice what, you know, Hannah, the mother of Samuel, understood this idea. Let's take a look at it. It's uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Here's what it says. This is, Han- this is Hannah's, Hannah's uh, testimony about God. Verse 1, 1 Samuel 2, verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. Is your horn exalted in the Lord this morning? Yes. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies. Because I rejoice in my salvation. And down to verse 7 and 8. The Lord maketh poor. And maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raises the poor out of the dust. And lifteth up the beggar out of the dunghill. I just love that text. To set them among princes. To make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. And he hath set the world upon them. You know the promised Laodicea is the him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me where? In my throne. Even as I am set down with my father in his throne. He became the seed of the woman in the covenant. The son of the father. You know, it's a perfect plan. Even the great God could have not made a better plan or conceive a better plan. They gave us a new father for the human family called the second Adam. It's mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And through this second Adam, we can choose to be born into a new family. Jesus told Nicodemus that you must be what? born again. That's what he's talking about. We're all in the first Adam when we come into this world. But he's given us the great choice of giving our hearts to Jesus and experiencing the new birth as the Holy Spirit 
uh, works in our minds and our hearts. And baptism is a symbol, a sign, a seal that we identify with Christ in his death, in his burial, and his resurrection. When a person goes down into the water, buried, right? Comes up in newness of life, and he shares that wonderful life with each one of us, his resurrection life. You know, in that sense, we can celebrate the resurrection every day as we, as we live the new life that we have in Christ. It's just not a one-time deal on the Passover time or Easter time, but it is an everyday thing. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus because of his perfect life that he shares with us. We could read about that, our time is gone. Romans 6, 3 to 6, some of you are taking notes. Romans 6, 3 to 6 talks about that. That new resurrection life is ours by giving ourselves to Jesus every day. Paul said, I die how often? Daily. And he said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but what? Christ liveth in me. That's a new birth. That's the new life we have in Christ. It's our celebration of the resurrection every day that we live. That's the Bible celebration of the resurrection. And the choice is always, our, always ours. Now I want to come to the end here. I have a four, four prong appeal to you this morning. Four prong. Is there someone here today? And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. So feel real good. Settle back in the seat. If there's someone here today who knows about this and yet, and yet has not given yourself to Jesus in a meaningful way. Is there somebody like that here today? Don't raise your hand. I'm just, just talking to you. A rhetorical question. Perhaps you'd like a pathway to baptism. There might be somebody like that here today which is the gateway to the sanctified life, a public demonstration that I belong to Jesus. I want to read one more text with this part of the appeal. It's Acts chapter 2, verse 38. It just came to mind. <laughs> Acts 2, verse 38. Acts 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you. How many of you? Amen. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall what? Receive. Gift of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, this is important. This is a very important step. There will be a baptism here, two Sabbaths from now. And uh, we hope the beginning of many more baptisms. And as the new father of the human race, the second Adam, he wants us to have a life more real, more glorious, more peaceful than Adam had in the beginning before the fall. That's what he wants to have. That's his eternal purpose. All this we have in the person of Jesus. Perhaps someone today here would like to become a member of Christ's body, which is the church. I hope you'll make that known to us because Jesus is the head of the body. Maybe there is someone here who would just like to reconsecrate your self to Jesus. You've been walking with Jesus for a long time and you just this morning want to reconsecrate yourself to the covenant. You know, none of us are, are saved apart from the covenant. That covenant relationship that the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost have among themselves, he shares with us. He wants us to be a part of that covenant and reconsecrate your, your lives to Jesus just now. Make your commitment today. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege of being able to learn to know you. We are thankful, Lord, for each one that's here today. We pray that you will take each life into your tender care as we go out into a new and uncertain week. I pray that you will be with each one today just according to our several needs. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.